Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. I thought one of the most interesting things actually was the fact that we'd probably been asked to talk about the same kind of thing. And, um, and when I was asked to talk about ICOs and tokens, what I kind of thought about immediately was something completely different from what Dave obviously thought about. Dave's thinking about it as money and I was thinking about all the aspects of ICOs as a speculative instrument or sort of quasi-equity um, on, on the bit that probably Dave would have considered to be the utility tokens. So um, um, Digital Jersey wouldn't you let me use this title in the, um, uh, in the social media um, marketing because they thought it was a bit somehow inflammatory but I squeezed it in there anyway. So uh, how do you make a small fortune trading ICOs? You start with a large one. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to kind of uh, burn down ICOs. I, I agreed with everything that Dave said about uh, the technology uh, and the use of money and the versatility and stuff like that. But there's so much kind of, uh, of the crazy kind of greed and, and stuff in, in the space that um, people are not making rational decisions about it. And so I think sometimes my role is sort of just tempering the enthusiasm. Um, so, um, you know, at the moment we have a listing for about 1,500 different tokens on various exchanges. At the moment, I think the average token is down about 80 to 85% from uh, all-time highs. Almost every one of those tokens probably hit an all-time high in December. Um, I'm not saying this is necessarily a bad thing, um, and we'll come on to um, uh, sort of some examples of the sort of evolution of technology and investment uh, phases in different markets and so forth later. But again, uh, we've seen various markets where, where um, it, particularly in South Korea, there's a lot of people that are hurting very badly, and and you know that has sort of consequences for the market in terms of the the uh, regulation and the pressure from. Uh, uh, sort of retail investors to pro possibly over-regulate markets or, or a, a kind of knee-jerk knee reaction. So I'm kind of sort of worried about that stuff. Uh, I love this chart, so I just had to figure out a way of in including it. It's uh, um, some guys in New Zealand, Brave New Coin, that um, came up with a taxonomic uh, classification for different tokens. It's a little bit old, so it hasn't got anything like 1500 on there. But I just think it's so nice and sort of organic. It's, there's something really sort of beautiful about it. And, and broadly speaking, I think that some of those uh, categories agree with the, the sort of categories that Dave was talking about in terms of some are uh, money, some have some kind of utility aspect to them, and some look more like securities. Um, we've looked at 200, uh, and a lot of them uh, in the last sort of six or eight months, and um, a lot of them are complete junk, but there's some really, really interesting stuff going on in the space. Um, and because there's been this $9 billion wall of money that has hit the space, it's attracted some super smart people um, who are doing some very creative things and they are pushing the envelope and so it, it's a very interesting place to look at the projects. The problem is just all the hangers-on that have arrived in the space as well uh, means that um, it's, it's rather labour-intensive to, uh, to sort of sort through the dross. I quite like this. It's a very, very short piece that uh, I stumbled across on Twitter uh, from the SATIS group that said that um, more than 80% of all the ICOs that they looked at were scams. Um, so again, um, if you're going to sort of operate in this space, um, you probably really need to uh, make it a full-time job if you expect to make any, any money out of it, um, just to avoid all of those. And I'm not ir even sure, you know, there's been um, VCs in the States uh, going back over the last sort of 20 or 30 years that um, have tried to figure out whether there's any anything thing that um, they can look at for the investments that they made or the investments they haven't made um, that will give them clues about which kind of projects they should be looking at in the future to avoid the mistakes that they made uh, in the past. And I don't think any of them have found any really good uh, indicators that separate one good project from one bad project uh, before those projects uh, get going. And so, uh, you know, do your homework. Um, I think Dave uh, has uh, probably put at least one Dilbert uh, blockchain um, on his Twitter feed and um, you know we're seeing these all the time and it sort of drives me nuts when you get an email from um, somebody that's developed an interesting piece of software which may well serve some kind of uh, uh, role in the real world and they've just decided to bolt some kind of digital ledger technology or token or something or even just insert the word blockchain in there somewhere 
so that they can turn it into an ICO and then they kind of email us to say, do we think that it would work as a blockchain? And they're upset when we sort of say no. Um, so, uh, and it doesn't really help that I think not even everybody, as, as Dave pointed out at the beginning of his, talk, his talk, that not everybody even really understands what sort of blockchain is or how it might be used and, and, and therefore trying to formulate when an application might be best served to be uh, blockchain based rather than it's perfectly sensible to have a centralized uh, database or, or whatever. Um, yeah, I'm not going to need 10 minutes for this stuff. Um, this is slightly different. It's something that I've sort of been very preoccupied with uh, recently, rightly or wrongly, but in the real world, um, the, the sort of uh, quantity theory of money and, uh, and uh, the equation of exchange that was sort of, I guess, has become something of a religion amongst the central banks in terms of uh, sort of monetary theory. It's all very well sort of imagining that uh, you can pull the levers even if you don't really know all the data, um, uh, as Dave pointed out, um, that when you put more money into the economy, if nothing else changes, then prices might go up uh, and so forth. The problem with that is that um, the, this V, the velocity of money, uh, is not really a known quantity and it changes very dramatically over time. If you look at velocity of circulation in the US, I think it's varied from sort of 6 to 14. Um, and, and, and as soon as you have that variable in there, which is sort of un, unknown and unmeasurable, except by implication from the other three bits of, of, of that uh, formula, it doesn't, really, uh, it doesn't really add anything. And, and so we're seeing the same in, in the crypto world, and I think it's really, really important in, in the crypto world, this sort of tokenomics and velocity of circulation. And there's a very, very good piece by uh, a guy called John Pfeffer, who was a, a KKR a venture capitalist, talking about this. And, and he argues very strongly, and I think it's sort of uh, uh, very credible, that if you take a utility token, that due to the, the construction of the token, there's no real need to hold it for any length of time, then people being rational will simply buy that token when they need it uh, and then sell it when they don't need it. And you will get this effect that all of those utility tokens will approach eventually, as you mentioned in the sort of 19th century examples, uh, the sort of utility value of those tokens. And as soon as they do, there's no need for speculators in that market. It's just a sort of cost plus exercise. So if, if, if an asset-backed token represents the underlying value of an asset, which might be a real-world asset and therefore you know, is speculative or non-speculative according to the real world, uh, and if a money token is trying to achieve sort of the purposes of money which require a certain degree of uh, stability, you, know, you don't want it to be too volatile um, because otherwise it doesn't really serve the purpose of money very well, um, then the only tokens that you're really talking about are speculative instruments are these utility or network tokens where you have some kind of decentralized application that, um, where the network effect is important and what people think they're buying when they buy those tokens is something like equity in the size of the network. So if you imagine that Facebook had issued a token when it launched and that you needed a token to hold your Facebook account, then when suddenly you've got 7 billion people on the planet, then those Facebook tokens are kind of worth more probably than they were worth when you first started. But then think about that, because if they're worth a lot more, then maybe the 7 billionth person to buy those tokens isn't going to pay a lot more, because if you still need one token to have a Facebook account, how much are you really going to pay for it? And there's a really good example in Australia. It's a really interesting technology called Horizon State, who are doing blockchain-based um, uh, voting. And it's already in use. Um, um, the uh, Australian federal government have, uh, have done a few votes uh, using it. So it's a really cool technology. But it has a token in, the, uh, uh, in its sort of uh, implementation, which, again, if you think about how if you have one token that needs to be one vote, as a speculator, why would you buy those tokens? Because as soon as those tokens get expensive, it's no longer going to be a competitive solution compared with existing solutions. So you need those tokens to be stable in value. So I think for lots of utility tokens, there's a reason for the token to exist, but there's no reason to buy it as a speculator, and therefore they're not really investments. Um, yeah, this is, um, when I first um, 
tried to find a, a little graphic for this. I, I was looking in the, um, for one um, from the mining industry because I used to trade uh, junior gold mining stocks and uh, junior gold mining stocks um, feel a lot like uh, ICO tokens because you tend to, uh, you find these, uh, these little penny stocks and uh, there's a couple of guys in a garage somewhere that have got some seismic shots and they think they've got a, um, a good idea of where there's some gold and, uh, and, and these stocks trade a penny or a couple of pennies for ages and ages and ages and then they keep on doing the work and eventually they make a little strike and there's a massive pop in, in the stock which is this sort of excitement um, part and then everybody realizes that actually they need 100 million or 200 million dollars to get the gold out of the ground and they've got to go and partner with Anglo-American or, or somebody they've got to get permits for uh, uh, polluting um, the uh, natural environment because uh, if you're a gold miner you need cyanide um, to, uh, to get, the, uh, um, the get, get the gold out of the ore and so forth. So five to seven years later you've gone through this trough of despair um, and uh, you've lost almost all of your original investors and then and only then is there an opportunity for the stock to sort of start to appreciate again um, when they start to move gold through um, uh, downstream and actually sell it. And it feels very, very much like you're going to see a lot of those uh, in the token space. There's lots of really, really interesting ideas, lots of great white papers. Some of them even have a proof of co concept or a sort of minimum viable product. But I think when they actually start to engineer those things with the 20 or 30 or 300 million dollars that they've, uh, they've raised through an ICO, um, and, and turn it into enterprise quality um, code, um, I think a lot of the early token holders are either going to be disappointed by how long that takes, which is always a lot longer than you think it's going to take, and by the, the sort of revenues that, that seem to derive from that um, when it actually starts to, to rock. So I, I definitely feel like we're in the trough of disillusionment uh, at the moment, and given that the peak was December, um, it's probably only early days. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had the happy talk, now you have to have the sad one. <laughs> so, um, we, uh, we had an in interesting conversation with a, a, a lawyer in uh, Jersey about anti-money laundering. No, actually that's wrong, because it's not an interesting conversation when it's about anti-money laundering. But, um, we had a conversation um, with, uh, with a lawyer here about uh, KYC and, uh, and uh, anti-money laundering legislation um, in the context of us as an investment manager taking funds from, for example, the Tezos Foundation. You know, they're sitting on half a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. They'd be a kind of a good client um, to, uh, to invest in. More, maybe more diversified portfolio of cryptocurrencies or maybe some other stuff as well. So then you have to start thinking of, of the KYC process for them as a client because generally speaking um, one school of thought might say that the tokens that they've issued and the money they've received, those tokens if they are any kind of a call on value for a product that doesn't yet exist but might exist, some people would call that equity and if that's equity then the people that have um, given them that money are kind of shareholders and so some compliance officers might say well actually that means that I need to do KYC on every person that has given money to the Tezos Foundation and good luck with that right so the, the, the real world continues to sort of put up boundaries both uh, deliberately and sort of accidentally um, um, in terms of sort of regulatory framework um, and and in a sense, it's sort of frustrating for us because we're trying to be a bridge between uh, this new technological world and, and the old world so that we can help less sophisticated institutional investors and, and, and sort of retail as well to, to access stuff, which is still clunky. All of the user experiences in, in the crypto world are pretty clunky still. And as you say, you don't want to be helping people to lose their keys and, and, and so forth. Um, but instead, what you're, what you're often faced with is this idea that maybe uh, it's better just for the crypto world to, to not try to interact at all with the, uh, with the old fiat uh, world and solve all of these problems uh, completely afresh. And one really good example of that is the sort of bankruptcy um, situations where Mt. Gox, um, when all the money was stolen, which is now five, six years ago, they went through a traditional bankruptcy procedure which has been sort of pretty badly mismanaged 
and here we are five or six years later, no money has been paid out to uh, um, uh, anybody that had uh, any balances with, uh, with Gox at the time. Meanwhile, a couple of years ago, Bitfinex was hacked uh, in a much smaller way, but within the space of two or three weeks, they decided to tokenize that hack uh, and give all of the people that had had money stolen uh, a token representing any claim that they managed to um, um, uh, retrieve uh, or recover. Um, and everybody, by the end of the year, had received uh, all of their uh, claims in full. So that was an, an old and painful, uh, an old world um, bankruptcy that was long and painful, and the only people that really did well uh, were probably the lawyers. Um, and a new reinvented bankruptcy um, uh, procedure, which has worked much more efficiently um, and uh, with no intermediation, um, has got everybody paid out in full. So I think we'll see a lot of this where the, the crypto world just decides to sort of circumvent the uh, existing regulatory framework as much as it possibly can. And I'd really, really like to see Jersey trying to sort of bridge that and somehow understand that that's the alternative and that if you put up barriers and you say that it's the precautionary principle means that we should be really conservative about the things that we do or the way that we interact with the crypto world, all you'll see is a sort of balkanization and, um, and somehow, um, certainly Jersey won't do very well out of that and, um, and I think it will be, we'll all be sort of somewhat worse off. But the SEC in the US are going in the opposite direction. I, mean, I think yesterday they arrested a couple of people for an ICO. And, um, and I think it's really sad to see um, and uh, a bit frustrating because I, I don't know the details of that particular ICO. It may well have been a scam, um, but um, it might have been a perfectly legitimate technological kind of innovation that it's just a, a couple of young guys that probably don't know that much about the regulatory framework um, and um, let their enthusiasm sort of run away with them. So, uh, yeah, that's it. I don't think there's any... Yeah. Thank you.